Father, we thank you for this story, which is at once very familiar, but still by the power of your Spirit can be fresh in our souls. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, see new dimensions of this story tonight in ways that you are inviting us to participate in it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this is a holy night. This is a wondrous night. This is a night worth celebrating. This is a night where words start to fail. It's not a good night to be a preacher um, because this is too big. But I've, as I was processing this passage this week, I, I kept coming back to a, a, a kind of a surprising thought that this was actually the night that changed nothing. As Luke 2 opens, God's people are oppressed. A narcissistic, power-hungry Roman Caesar has set off a wave of mass migration back to people's hometowns for the purpose of counting everyone, including every oppressed Jew. Why? So he could collect more taxes. Riots are breaking out all across the empire. His soldiers are violently quelling those riots. Just a typical day in the Pax Romana. But this census forces a young man and a very pregnant young woman to move from Nazareth to Bethlehem, a 70-mile uphill journey. Now, this couple is nothing to the Romans, and they're a scandal to the Jews, not yet married with a baby, not yet explained. The town is teeming with people pouring in for the census, so much so that all the guest rooms built into the backs of people's homes are full. That's probably what that word translated in actually means in the story. Don't think there wasn't any room in the hotel. Think no room in the guest rooms that were built into the back of Palestinian houses. So Mary and Joseph have to set up right in someone's living room, probably a distant family member. Now, in uh, houses in Palestine, the the animals were were a family's most prized possession, right? Uh, You can still get a glimpse of this if if you join us on a pilgrimage to Rwanda, right? So they lived actually right next to the living room under the same roof. They were separated by this this half wall from the main living area with a feeding trough in between, i.e. the manger. So when you're imagining this night, imagine that that is where Mary and Joseph are camped out. Everyone's crammed in, overcrowded, uncomfortable, exactly the opposite of COVID land. Like, and you've got it. And then the baby comes. No privacy, no space, no fancy crib, no Amazon wish lists, only that manger to lay him in. I'm sure they all oohed and awed over the baby. I'm sure an animal, you know, did something cute, like try to nudge the baby as he's trying to get to his food or something. I'm sure they all congratulated Mary and Joseph in front of their faces and behind their backs. They whispered about who the father might be or secretly chided them for not being able to wait till marriage. I'm sure Joseph was exhausted, Mary was in a lot of pain, and Jesus wailed for that first feeding. And after that first feeding, Jesus fell asleep And nothing had changed. Nothing was fixed. Rome was still oppressing. Mary and Joseph were still displaced. They were all still crammed into this living room. If anything, Mary and Joseph's lives were now harder, right? Because the real work begins when a baby comes. Can I get an amen? Nothing that was wrong with the world got better. Jesus' coming changed nothing. But of course, that cramped house wasn't the only place where God was working. The the shepherds also got quite a show, right? Shepherds were the underclass of society. Isolated, culture-shunning nomads who had a reputation for hiding out along roads and um, supplementing their income a bit um, by robbing people. They weren't even trusted to be witnesses in legal proceedings, And you might think, oh, well, shepherds, you know, they're they're like farmers, right? No, they were most likely tending flocks intended to be sacrificed in Jerusalem. They're more like day or night laborers. They don't even own the sheep they're watching. But the angels come to them. To them, of all people, God loves doing things upside down. 
And the angels use words about this baby very similar to words Caesar used about himself. The angels told them that they had good news for the shepherds. Caesar would use that word about himself. A king had been born, an anointed rescuer, a savior, the son of God. More Caesar words that he would use for himself. Now this was, of course, a slightly big deal. So the shepherds rush into Bethlehem from house to house trying to find Mary and Joseph and the baby and then they find them and then they see them and I'm sure that was awkward. Um, Then they go back to house after house after house shouting and yelling and telling everyone what they have seen and nobody believes them because they are shepherds. And then they go back to their sheep. Same stinky sheep. Same hard ground to sleep on. Same isolation. Same bad reputation. It had been this night of divine fireworks, angelic visitations, and excitement, and it changed nothing. The only difference from the beginning of the night to the end was this baby, lying in a feeding trough, doing what babies do. Nothing. All Advent long, we have been straining our eyes, waiting for the coming of Jesus. And all year long, We have been imagining, hoping, longing for change. We have been weighed down by racial injustice, political dysfunction, this pandemic, and the limits it places on us, all the tension that brings into families and griefs um, that that brings into our relationships. So we come to the end of 2020 hungry for something to change, hungry for something to be fixed, hungry for joy. Christmas trees this year were gone way early from lots. We went kind of near our normal time, and I always get like the biggest tree I can possibly fit into our foyer. They were gone. Got this little short thing. Because people were so hungry for joy. They were so hungry for hope, so hungry for something to shift. And we come tonight with that hunger. We come tonight hungering for God to come and to make all things new, to fix what is broken out there and in here. But tonight, we will go home, or we will turn off the stream, as it were, and we'll go to bed. And we'll get up tomorrow, and hopefully we will have a great day, and then we'll go to bed again. And then we'll get up, and then we'll go to bed again. And we'll get up and go to bed again. And, and, and each day will probably be very much the same as it was the day before in terms of the problems that are staring us in the face. And we'll wonder, did this even do anything? Did this even matter? Was this just a a distraction from all the bad things? Did Jesus coming actually fix anything? I'm sure the shepherds wondered that a month later. Man, that was a weird trip. I'm sure Mary wondered in her exhaustion and her homelessness. I'm sure a few years later she really wondered when she was on the run from Herod, displaced as a political refugee. Did Jesus coming even matter? Friends, yes, it matters, but not probably in the way we want it to yet, because tonight changes nothing that is broken except our broken image of who God actually is. We are continually tempted to have a false view of who God is. Our our minds are always fall back into less than images of God. And one of those is we tend to fall back into an image of God who who is ultimate power, but is kind of far off, sort of disengaged, a God who stands back and just lets things play out, a God who sometimes doesn't seem to care, doesn't rescue us out of our suffering the way we think he should if he were good. For many of us, we doubt that God is good more than we doubt God is great. We doubt His love more than His power. We don't doubt whether He can fix what's broken. We doubt whether He wants to. But this night, in the beating heart of this little baby, God shows us His heart. Because before God fixes what is broken, He enters the broken. Before God defeats evil, he suffers under evil. Before God rescues us from pain, he steps into our pain. Before God unites us to himself, he unites himself to us. Before God shows off his power, he reveals his goodness. 
He reveals that he is not far off, that he is not uncarried, that he does not suffer from any lack of desire. He recklessly, passionately longs for our wholeness so much that the Son of God throws off the privileges of heaven, limits himself within the bounds of humanity, and comes to be with us as Emmanuel. This is the consistent pattern of God in the gospel. First, God reveals his love, and then he exercises that love and power. We see it here in the incarnation. We see it in first coming to the cross before we ever get to the power of the resurrection. We see it in him sending a church with the power of the spirit that has no sword, that has no way to keep itself safe, only a commitment to suffer for the sake of God and others because there is a fervent expectation that his second coming will vindicate those sacrifices and truly make all things new. Love, then power. I think God does this because we are prone to a perennial temptation to worship God because of what he gives us. It is easy to treat God like a politician. We vote him in when he promises to do good things, vote him out when he fails to follow through. It is easy to treat God like uh, maybe, maybe a kid's teacher. We doubt him when the lesson is hard, especially when it's online, and we praise him when the assignment is easy. It's easy to treat God like a therapist. We go to him when he works for us, and we stop going when he doesn't work for us because, you know, he's kind of expensive. We value his power, especially when it gets us what we think is best for us. But church, God is not a tool that we use for our own ends God is the one we worship because he is worthy of it. We do not trust him. We do not give our allegiance to him. We do not count him as more important than anyone or anything else in the entire universe, including ourselves, because of what he gives us as if our comfort and satisfaction was the barometer of his worth. We worship him because of who he is. He is the only one who is both strong and kind, mighty and gentle, powerful and sacrificial. We're always tempted to take the shortcut, to to go for the power without the goodness, the might without the love, the influence without the empathy, because we think it can get something done. But that would be a terror. That's the very definition of a tyrant. We do not end up worshiping tyrants. We end up fearing them. But tonight, we come with no fear, because tonight... We celebrate God who intentionally became weak for us. Tonight, we proclaim that the one who made the stars slept under starlight. Tonight, we treasure the word of God who couldn't yet speak a word. Tonight, it's not too much to say that we worship strength held back, power made impotent, salvation made slow. Tonight, we rejoice in the fact that God's Son did not just whisk us off to His perfect world like we might prefer. Instead, He came to our broken world to be misunderstood, to have His feelings hurt, to be thirsty, to be betrayed, to be sick, to die, all so that we might know this wasn't just His side project. This wasn't just something He, he, he did on the side. We were the very pursuit and center of His hearts. All so we can know the depths of his love for us. All so we would never have to drown in the doubt of does God understand? Does God see? Does God care? Does he get injustice? Has he suffered under a corrupt regime? Has he felt my pain? Yes. Yes, he has. He does. He gets it because he came. And because he came, one day everything will be made right. See, this night is indeed the pivot point of history. It's when everything turns on its axis, just imperceptibly. But the point where everything starts rolling downhill to redemption, where history starts gaining speed over the decades and centuries and millennia until we run headlong into a world where both God's power and love, His greatness and goodness are on full display. In the midst of that rollicking journey, we get glimpses of him breaking in in power all along the way. And we give thanks for those. 
But for now, God has not yet brought us to the full feast. He has not yet filled our hunger for his power to make all things new, just as he did not fill it that night. Instead, on this night, he gives us a manger filled with hay and a baby boy, his very son. A baby boy who on this night could do nothing for us. In Luke's account, he actually repeats the word manger three times for emphasis. It's a strange detail to keep emphasizing except for the fact that perhaps the Spirit is saying to us in our hunger, this is your feast. There is wilderness and chaos and oppression and abuses of power and all is not as it should be. But come here and feast on my goodness. Feast on my love for you. Feast on my presence with you. Feast on the fact that I care, that I understand, that I will stop at nothing to be with you. Feast not on just what I can do for you. Feast on me. Friends, at the end of a hard 2020, it is hard to hear that this is the night that changed nothing that circumstances stayed stubborn, that oppression did not cease. But this is the night when it was revealed that the Son of God came all the way to us because He loved us. And that will actually, eventually, change everything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you for having something worth celebrating this night, but we confess that if we had to throw a party, we might have imagined it a little differently. God, in our longing for you to come and fix May we see clearly, like a light shining in a dark place, your heart for us, your love for this world, your willingness to go straight into the hardest places, harder than many of us have walked. Give us the hope and the joy that spring from knowing that you are with us. And anywhere you are will not resist your power to save. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.